The anima is a personification of all feminine psychological tendencies in a man's psyche, such as vague feelings and moods, prophetic hunches, receptiveness to the irrational, capacity for personal love, feeling for nature, and, last but not least, his relation to the unconscious. It is no mere chance that in olden times priestesses, like the Greek Sibyl, were used to fathom the divine will and to make connection with the gods. In its individual manifestation, the character of a man's anima is as a rule shaped by his mother. If he feels that his mother had a negative influence on him, his anima will often express itself in irritable, depressed moods, uncertainty, insecurity, and touchiness. If, however, he is able to overcome the negative assaults on himself, they can even serve to reinforce his masculinity. Within the soul of such a man, the negative mother anima figure will endlessly repeat this theme. I am nothing. Nothing makes any sense. With others it's different, but for me, I enjoy nothing. These anima moods cause a sort of dullness, a fear of disease, of impotence, or of accidents. The whole of life takes on a sad and oppressive aspect. Such dark moods can even lure a man to suicide, in which case the anima becomes a death demon. She appears in this role in Cocteau's film Orphée. The French call such an anima figure a femme fatale. A milder version of this dark anima is personified by the Queen of the Night in Mozart's Magic Flute. The Greek sirens, or the German Lorelei, also personify this dangerous aspect of the anima, which in this form symbolizes destructive illusion. The following Siberian tale illustrates the behavior of such a destructive anima. One day, a lonely hunter sees a beautiful woman emerging from the deep forest on the other side of the river. She waves at him and sings, O oh, come, lonely hunter, in the stillness of dusk. Come, come, I miss you, I miss you. Now I will embrace you, embrace you. Come, come, my nest is near, my nest is near. Come, come, lonely hunter, now in the stillness of dusk. He throws off his clothes and swims across the river, but suddenly she flies away in the form of an owl, laughing mockingly at him. When he tries to swim back to find his clothes, he drowns in the cold river. In this tale, the anima symbolizes an unreal dream of love, happiness, and maternal warmth, her nest, a dream that lures men away from reality. The hunter is drowned because he ran after a wishful fantasy that could not be fulfilled. Another way in which the negative anima in a man's personality can be revealed is in waspish, poisonous, effeminate remarks by which he devalues everything. Remarks of this sort always contain a cheap twisting of the truth and are in a subtle way destructive. There are legends throughout the world in which a poison damsel, as they call her in the Orient, appears. She is a beautiful creature who has weapons hidden in her body or a secret poison with which she kills her lovers during their first night together. In this guise, the anima is as cold and reckless as certain uncanny aspects of nature itself and in Europe is often expressed to this day by the belief in witches. If, on the other hand, a man's experience of his mother has been positive, this can also affect his anima in typical but different ways, with the result that he either becomes effeminate or is preyed upon by women, and thus is unable to cope with the hardships of life. An anima of this sort can turn men into sentimentalists, or they may become as touchy as old maids, or as sensitive as the fairy tale princess who could feel a pea under thirty mattresses. A still more subtle manifestation of a negative anima appears in some fairy tales in the form of a princess who asks her suitors to answer a series of riddles, or perhaps to hide themselves under her nose. If they cannot give the answers, or if she can find them, they must die, and she invariably wins. The anima in this guise involves men in a destructive intellectual game. We can notice the effect of this anima trick in all those neurotic pseudo-intellectual dialogues that inhibit a man from getting into direct touch with life and its real decisions. He reflects about life so much that he cannot live it, and loses all his spontaneity and outgoing feeling. The most frequent manifestation of the anima takes the form of erotic fantasy. Men may be driven to nurse their fantasies by looking at films and striptease shows, or by daydreaming over pornographic material. 
This is a crude, primitive aspect of the anima, which becomes compulsive only when a man does not sufficiently cultivate his feeling relationships, when his feeling attitude toward life has remained infantile. All these aspects of the anima have the same tendency that we have observed in the shadow. That is, they can be projected so that they appear to the man to be the qualities of some particular woman. It is the presence of the anima that causes a man to fall suddenly in love when he sees a woman for the first time and knows at once that this is she. In this situation, the man feels as if he has known this woman intimately for all time. He falls for her so helplessly that it looks to outsiders like complete madness. Women who are of fairy-like character especially attract such anima projections because men can attribute almost anything to a creature who is so fascinatingly vague and can thus proceed to weave fantasies around her. The projection of the anima in such a sudden and passionate form as a love affair can greatly disturb a man's marriage and can lead to the so-called human triangle with its accompanying difficulties. A bearable solution to such a drama can be found only if the anima is recognized as an inner power. The secret aim of the unconscious in bringing about such an entanglement is to force a man to develop and to bring his own being to maturity by integrating more of his unconscious personality and bringing it into his real life. 